morning, Jesus Image family. I wanna welcome our online guest with us as well that is worshiping with us today. The Lord had me in the book of Esther this past week and I just really was reminded of when she went before the king. And I really believe that many of you come this morning desperate for the Lord, desperate for his presence, desperate for healing, whatever it may be. I just wanted to read as Esther had had everyone fast where she knew that her people could be destroyed. And I said, now it happens on the third day that Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the king's palace across from the king's house while the king sat on his royal th throne in the royal house facing the entrance of the house. So it was when the king saw Queen Esther standing in the court that she found favor in his sight and the king held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. Then Esther went near and touched the top of the scepter and the king said to her, what do you wish, Queen Esther? What is your request? It shall be given to you up to half the kingdom. And as I was reading that, I was just reminded of how Queen Esther went before him with her need out of desperation and the king looked at her and found favor upon her. He didn't look at her or see her need. He looked at her and he saw her, his bride. He saw the one that he loved. And that's how he looks at us. When we go before him, he looks at us as his bride, the one that he came and left heaven to die for and to be with us. He come to be with us. That's his desire. So let's come to him this morning, adoring our King who's on the throne. Jesus, we love you. Jesus, we come before you. And I thank you that it says, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Jesus, we come to you with our need. We look to you, Jesus, we worship you, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We thank you for your presence today. We long for your presence. We wanna drink of your presence, Jesus. We need you, we love you, we worship you. You are our king, you are our bridegroom. You're the one that we adore. We love you, Jesus, and we praise and we worship you this morning. May you be adored on our worship in Jesus' name, amen. We just begin to adore the Lord. Oh, we love you, Jesus. We just begin to lift our voice and welcome the King of glory. We welcome the King of glory.
Ah. Uh-huh. 
just lift our hands to the Lord? Actually, let's join hands as a church family, just not across the aisles. Father, we love you. Why don't you just lift your voices, just begin praying in this spirit. Father, we love you. We give you all the glory, all the honor, all the majesty, all the praise belongs to you. We've come, Lord, to give great glory to your name. And we ask you, Holy Spirit, to, to use us, use us to glorify the precious name of Jesus. We plead the blood, Lord, this morning. We ask you to wash us and cleanse us. And we enter by the blood of Jesus into the most holy place, to the throne of grace. With boldness we come and gratitude. And we ask you, wonderful Holy Spirit, to move and show your glory. Be deeply ministered to, wonderful Jesus. Be loved here today. I pray that we would deeply love you and that this would minister to your heart. Glorify the holy and sacred and powerful name of Jesus, wonderful Holy Spirit. In Jesus' precious name, everybody said, now can we lift a praise? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lord. Come on, bless his name this morning. Oh, we give you all the glory. Come on, bless his name. We give you all the glory and honor. Praise you, Lord. Blessed be your precious name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the precious cross. Help us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we thank the Lord just one more time? Give you all the glory, Lord. All the glory. You're welcome to go back to your seats. Can we thank our worship team and choir, please? y'all. Can we welcome Diane, please? Diane, come on. How oh, we love Diane. Jesus. I have the privilege and the honor to collect the tithes and offerings today, and what a joy. It is a true joy and an honor. And I was thinking how um, we were giving glory to the Lord, and we were singing, He is the Alpha, He is the Omega, He is the beginning and the end. So that means He knows the beginning from the end, so we can trust Him. We can trust Him with everything. And that means we withhold nothing from him. So if he is um, putting on someone's heart to give an amount, we don't have to worry because he is the alpha and the omega. He is the beginning and the end, and he knows all. So thank you, Jesus. And I want you guys to just stay locked in because this is holy. This time is a holy time before the Lord. And in, um, in Leviticus 27, it says, In all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. And it is holy to the Lord. And I think of Pastor Michael and how he talked about how the Lord generously gave. He talked about that for a long time, the generous giver that he was. And it says in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that we would not perish, but have everlasting life. And so who are we to withhold anything from the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the one who gave all, he gave all for us. And so what is a 10th, right? What is a 10th? What is that? So I think about, um, John, or, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians 9, uh, 6, but I say, but this I say, he who's, 
who sows sparingly will reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one of us give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or out of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And I love how the Lord wants to give to us abundantly. But if we withhold and we hold on to our money, he can't have intimacy, he can't have that relationship that he desires with us. But if we loosely give, if we give him, he so willingly wants to give back to us. So thank you, Jesus. I'm gonna pray. Lord, I just thank you, God. I thank you as they purpose in their heart, God, today that you see their heart, you see their desire, Lord, to give back to you because you freely gave. You freely gave, God. So I thank you, Holy Spirit. I thank you, Lord, for um, each and every person who is giving, Lord, right now, what they are desiring, Lord. And I thank you, Lord, that you are so faithful, so faithful, God, to give back to them abundantly above, more than they can think or imagine. So we thank you, Lord. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. And you guys can um, follow the prompts on the screen. If you're in here in the sanctuary and you need an envelope, just raise your hand and an usher will help you. And you guys can rush the buckets.
Good morning, everyone. Welcome. We are going to be stepping into a special time of baby dedication. So if we can welcome the families up and also welcome up Pastor Michael and Jessica. Well, Jess is limping a little. You can take your seats. She uh, fell at Target. <laughs> uh, they, they left stuff on the ground and somebody spilled a drink and she slipped. So Got she it. wanted me to make sure you guys knew she was okay. And I know. <laughs> so she'll get healed today though. Yeah. Amen. All right. If I Amen. Just put this so here. the first family we have is the Lopez family with uh, Nathaniel being can, dedicated. Can you see that hat? This hat is the best. Um, this is awesome. Nathaniel? It's wonderful. Let's stretch our hands. Maybe we can just pray in the spirit, actually. Father, we thank you for Nathaniel. Thank you for this gift. We ask you, precious Lord, to keep him, that your anointing would come upon him, that you would mark him, and that he'd live with you and walk with you all of his days that he'd never know a single day outside the fold, and that you'd bless this family with your glory and abundance and make they walk by the river in Jesus' holy name. Amen. 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 Come on, give the Lord praise. <laughs> wow, look at those eyes. And our second family is the Jacksons family with uh, Remy being dedicated. What's her name? Remy. Remy. Let's stretch our hands. Lord, thank you for this sweet gift. I pray, Lord, for your word to fill her heart, that you would use her for your glory and namesake, and that your anointing would rest upon her, and that she'd know you and love you, that she'd raise a godly family with godly children. May this entire family line know you. We dedicate her to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Let's thank the Lord. Is that it? Oh, that's the easiest one. Come on, guys. Let's stand and welcome them. Bless them. God bless you. Yeah, God bless you. God bless you. Congratulations. So beautiful. Here you go. God bless you. Congratulations. Those eyes are something. The eyes are beautiful. <laughs> All right. Isn't that beautiful? Yes. Can we thank the Lord one more time? Thank you, Dion. All right, let's stand to our feet. I'm going to ask you to pray. Sorry, you know how it is. I'm going to ask you to pray in the spirit here for about a minute. Come on, out loud. Just lift your hands to heaven. Come on, lift your voices. I want to hear a rumble in this room. Yeah, pick up those keys a little, Joe. Oh, wonderful. Holy Spirit. Fill this place with you. you. guys keep praying. Fill this place with your glory, with your presence. Open our eyes, open our hearts, open our ears to see, to hear you. Lord, to receive your holy and precious word. To the move of the Holy Spirit, fill this house this morning, Lord. Set many people free, I pray in Jesus' blessed name. Heal the sick in Jesus' blessed name. Bring people out of darkness into your glorious light. Just another 30 seconds. Oh, Father, speak to us. Speak to us, we pray. Speak to us, Lord. Give us ears to hear. Give us humble hearts. Little longer. Give you all the glory, all the honor, all the praise is yours. Just a little more. This is wonderful. Precious Lord, precious Lord, we are your children. We are the sheep of your pasture, and we ask you to fill us today. Fill us with your divine word, your divine life, the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. We come hungry, Lord. We come needy, knowing nothing in and of ourselves, saying, teach us, beautiful, heavenly teacher. 
Teach us your ways. Teach us your precious word. Feed us yourself. In Jesus' name. Oh, that's awesome. Come on, give the Lord all the praise. Can you do that? We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. Oh, we love you, Lord. All right. Let's get started here. Got some dear friends with us this morning and over the next few days. The Crandalls are here, Tom and Leslie, all the way from Reading. So can we just welcome them and love on them? You got up for them? Wow. It's awesome. They flew in last night from Reading, as is usual, got delayed out of San Francisco. I remember that flight. But they're here and uh, made it here even with the time change. <laughs> Speaking of that, I do have a nice healthy rebuke. Can you zoom in on me? <laughs> really, bring, come in real close to all of our virtual church this morning of which there is no such thing. I have a quote for you. And for everyone else who just straggled on in a little late because the covers were so nice and such a struggle. After all, we're so persecuted here in Orlando. Such a dangerous land to get to church in. Here's one for you. This will make you feel wonderful and zoom in real good. I really hope those of you who stay home can't get a seat tonight. Let's all join hands, not across the aisles. I want you to agree with me. May you have to come so early tonight. May you watch the service from your cars in the parking lot tonight. Here's one for you. This will really make you feel uplifted and loved by Papa Daddy. All right, are you ready? The martyrs gave their blood for the truth, and you are not able to come to church. They gave their lives for Christ, and you cannot make a small journey for him from your home. But you say, I'm a sinner, I cannot come. Then cease to be one and get to church. St. John Chrysostom, 4th century church father who wrote the divine litur liturgy, let it land as it needs to. Now for those of you who did make it, May you leave completely drunk and filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm going to only ask, I'm going to ask that you don't lay hands on anyone who missed church. Do not impart what you got this morning. Hold it back. I told Floyd Beth I was going to do it. I love you, but I have work to do, clearly. So we're going to keep going. All right, that was fun. <laughs> Blame St. John Chrysostom. Not me. Blame Jess. She told me to do this. <laughs> tonight is going to be very sacred. We're going to have a true general with us tonight. And I'm not, I, uh, he, here's the reason I, I want to say this to you. It's because the word that's going to come forth tonight, I believe, is going to help establish our lives in Christ forever so I'm going to ask you to get here and uh, come early come hungry for the Lord it's going to be awesome Jesus 24 is stirring and burning on the west coast can we put that slide up Christ crucified Jesus 24 June 6th through the 8th I just got home Thursday from uh, the west coast I was ministering in Orange County with our dear friends the circuit riders down in Costa Mesa and man, that place is burning and so filled with faith and so appreciative that we're coming. They prayed a blessing over us. Uh, many leaders were there on, on Monday night when I ministered, some really incredible pastors, and they said, do all that's in your heart to do this summer in Southern California. We need a move of God. So I want to encourage you guys, listen. If you don't have the funds to go, believe God. Believe God, purpose in your heart, especially many of you who feel, feel called to the nations as missionaries. This is a great, great missions opportunity. I think Tom and Leslie would vouch for the fact that California needs Jesus. And uh, our friends from Reading are, are rolling down in droves. 
our friends in Dallas from Upper Room are coming in in, by, in droves. I'm going to ask you all, come on, let's get over there. Let's worship Jesus and let's give away the fire that, the God, that God has given us here. That being said, register, register quickly. We will turn people away and it's going to be powerful and glorious. We did get a final confirmation from the sisters of Mary, the evangelical sisters. They are coming as well. To see uh, such a group, can we put the, just some of the speakers up? Who would have thought the day would come where Pastor Bill, my father-in-law, and Francis would minister with evangelical charismatic nuns? We'll take all of Jesus we can get. Amen? So it's going to be phenomenal. Phoenix is right around the corner, March 22nd. For those of you in Arizona, anywhere in the desert, in Southern Cal, Palm Springs area, Tucson, Flagstaff, get to this. Uh, people are registering like crazy. It's going to be phenomenal. I'm really, really excited about this. All right. Lastly, Good Friday. Good Friday. How we love Good Friday. Are you grateful for the cross? And uh, make sure to get here. It's going to be beautiful. And we're going to receive Holy Communion. I'm going to teach on the passion of Jesus. And expect the Lord to heal all who are sick. Amen. So let's come and prepare our hearts that entire week during Holy Week. It's such a blessed journey. All right, that's it. Let's get into our Bibles. How many of you enjoyed Dean Becker last Sunday morning? Well, <laughs> I've heard him minister many times. For those of you who don't know, uh, Dean Corne Becker is the Dean of Divinity at Regent University. And I've heard him speak multiple times. I have never seen him so fired up as when he took the platform here. I was kind of taken back by it. I was like, wow, Dean, I didn't know you had this side of you. But his teaching on what it means to be a true disciple on the image of Jesus, uh, beginning uh, with the icon of God, which is the image of God, I, I just thought that was so beautiful that that is, that is seen and fulfilled in the person of the Lord Jesus himself, amen? And then his entry into the Beatitudes was phenomenal. And how badly we need a reintroduction of who Jesus is. That's number one. Number two, our vision of Jesus will always determine and frame what it means to be a disciple. And that's why the elimination of the cross from our preaching, it actually weakens and dilutes the vision of being a disciple. If Jesus himself is in our theology, then we really have no framework for self-sacrifice, for serving. Like there's a huge initiative now to attack churches who allow people to serve. Well, let me, let me explain this to you. If you take servitude out of the Christian experience, you don't have one. You, Calvary was not a spa. The incarnation was not pleasant. From the birth of Jesus, even prior to that, from the conception of Jesus by the Holy Spirit in the Virgin Mary, how many of you know that uh, the Lord had a pretty good atmosphere going on in the throne room when he chose to come in by the Spirit and live in the womb of a 14-year-old virgin, unseen? Pretty incredible to be willing to do that when you're beheld by billions of angels nonstop for eternity. So we need a, a, a clear vision of who Jesus is, number one. And that he is impossible to define outside the cross. If you leave the cross out of your preaching, you're creating a self-help superhero who is an employee that works for you. And we do, I agree, you know, I'll never forget years ago, I didn't understand that at the time, but Heidi whispered to me in one of our meetings, she said, we need a theology for suffering. Because if you don't have a theology for suffering that's found in Calvary's account, it's found in the whole Bible. I mean, you can't read the words of Paul who says, <laughs> we're led to the slaughter daily and think that's an easy road. If you don't have a theology for pain in life, for suffering, for everything that comes at the believer, that by the way is promised. If it's promised, it shouldn't be so surprising. 
If you don't have a theology for suffering, you will begin to rebuke and cast away what God is allowing to form you into his image. You, I, I, let me just say this. The cross was God's idea. <laughs> that was not the Romans' idea. It was not the Jews' idea. The cross is the Lord's idea. And so any disciple is offered the cross. Every disciple is offered the cross. You say, how often? Daily. And that cross, that crucified life, is the entry point or the on-ramp, as I like to say, into the resurrection life, into a life of glory. More cross, more glory. More fellowship of his sufferings, more power of his resurrection. These two are parallel tracks. And to eliminate the tree is to eliminate everything. So I love that Dean Becker landed and gave you so much theology and church history and uh, language from the fathers of the church who clearly defined the message of the gospel and how we need it again. So let's get back into very quickly. I, wanna, I just want to end in Luke 4, which is the, we've come now, just for those of you who are, who are new, uh, I've never been here before, by the way. Welcome. If you're here for the first time, would you just raise your hand very quickly and put it up? Wow, look at all of you. God, this is beautiful. Can we thank them, church? Let's thank them. Honored to have you here this morning. And for those of you who don't know, we, we, we began a journey in the Lord Jesus' life. We preceded the nativity with the prophetic utterances from the Old Testament through Christmas, we walked into the nativity of the Lord Jesus and we camped out on the incarnation for weeks and that was beautiful. What an awesome time. From there, I taught on epiphany or the baptism of the Lord Jesus, what that all meant. I, that was really fun to teach. I've got to be honest with you. I get filled with the Spirit as I'm teaching this stuff. And we talked about the coming of the Spirit upon the Lord Jesus, what the baptism of the Lord Jesus fulfilled scripturally, how he identified with man completely. We know that baptism was a baptism of repentance and Jesus had no reason to repent. Therefore, it was a baptism of identification, right? The, the entire Trinity is seen at the baptism of Jesus. The Father speaks, the Son is highlighted and the Holy Spirit comes upon him. And that tells us something. The Trinity is revealed through the Lord Jesus Christ. If I want to know what the Holy Spirit is like, look no further than Jesus. If I want to know what the Father is like, look no further than Jesus. So Hebrews 1 teaches us that Jesus is the express image of God, the very brightness of his glory. And that does not apply to only the Father. I actually talked to Dean Becker in the back because I've been preaching it and I wanted to make sure that I was right. I was pretty sure I was. But this is true. The Holy Spirit himself, his nature is seen in the life of the Lord Jesus because of the Lord's yieldedness to the Spirit. If you want to know what it looks like to fully obey the Holy Spirit, look no further than Jesus. And that's why the Lord Jesus told the disciples, speaking of the coming of the Spirit, for you know him because he's with you. And the reason he was with the disciples is because he was upon the Lord Jesus. They had access to the person of the Spirit because the Spirit anointed Messiah was their everything. Make sense? We went from there into the wilderness account and the temptation of the Lord Jesus and the Lord's victory over Satan. Adam failed in a beautiful garden to the eye. Jesus defeats temptation in a dead wilderness. Can you see the beautiful wisdom of God, right? Adam fails and Eve fails because of the lust of the eye, the pride of life, and lust of the flesh. Jesus renounces lust of the flesh through the temptation of bread and food, right? He has shown the kingdoms of this world, lust of the eye. He resists, I love this, he resists the pride of life by testing God and casting himself off the pinnacle of the temple. So Jesus shows us and completely redeems what Adam and Eve failed them in a beautiful garden, Jesus in a barren wilderness. Awesome. I said awesome. He went into a wilderness so we could live in a garden again. Incredible. 
incredible wisdom. So now the Lord moves out of that wilderness and shows up in Luke chapter 4. And we talked about, well, actually, let's just, let's just go there. We've got a little time. Maybe somebody could help me read. Uh, everyone's gone who usually does that. I guess I'll do it. Amy, you want to do it? Amy Gray? Can we get her a mic? Luke, could you grab a mic for her? David and Lily had their baby yesterday, or the day before yesterday. Amazing. We're populating the church. We have a lot of babies here. Well, anyways, keep going. Luke 4, Amy, we're going to start at verse 14 and read through verse 22. Then Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and news of him went out through all the surrounding region. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. So he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. And so we talked, hold just, I'm going to walk with you here. So we talked about a few things. Number one, if the Holy Spirit's upon you, truly, you do not need to self-promote. It says news of him went throughout all of the surrounding region. We've got less anointing now and more self-promotion than ever. We need to flip that script. We need more anointing, less self-promotion. I'm not talking about promoting an event or anything, but if you live to do you and put yourself on a pedestal, it's typically due to lack of encounter with the Holy Spirit. Keep reading. He taught in their, actually, I'll, I'll catch up with you. He taught in their synagogues. That means Jesus went to church and saw value in teaching in the church. So he came to Nazareth. It means he went to his hometown. So he started off in a rough spot because a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown. Notice it was his custom to go to synagogue, so Jesus valued the corporate family and corporate worship. And keep reading now, you can start Amy, and he was handed the book. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. So Jesus read the Bible. Let's say that again. Jesus, the Word, found it necessary to read Holy Scripture. And read the Old Testament and never called it the Old Testament. Just called it scripture. Keep reading there, Amy. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. All right, there's only one book opener. I said there's only one book opener. Remember that phrase, he opened the book. Keep, keep reading, Amy. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed now me. Now he talks about the fact, he's basically saying I am the, I am the one. I am the one who is promised the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Now let me tell you why. Because he hath anointed me. For too long in charismatic circles, we've made the anointing something. Like a, you can almost like, I don't know, grab it and give it away. And we have to, now there is an impartation. There is no doubt the anointing is contagious. But we've got to, we've got to remember something. The anointing is as much a verb as anything. In other words, he's telling us how the Spirit of the Lord is upon him. And he explains why. Because he hath anointed me or smeared me. The word means to rub me, to rub the presence of the Spirit into me. So what are we anointed with truly? The power and presence and person of the Holy Spirit. Not separate from him. We are clothed with the Spirit Himself, filled with the Spirit at salvation, clothed in the Spirit, Acts 1 8, for service. But n make no bones about it. When we say we've been anointed by the Spirit, we are saying we have been smeared and rubbed by the Lord with the person of the Spirit Himself. That's an honor. Keep reading there, Amy. To preach the gospel to the poor. Now we talk about the purpose of the anointing of the Spirit. It's to preach the gospel. Say the gospel. the gospel. All right, keep going. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. This is the healing power of the Lord that every ministry should have. Every ministry that's truly anointed should reach into the brokenness of humanity at a heart level. And brokenhearted here doesn't mean blood pump. I'm not talking about the muscle. It's talking about the center of man's being the depths of every depth. He is telling us here that through the gospel and through the activity and work of the Spirit, 
that Jesus has called us to be used to heal man at the very depth and epicenter of their brokenness. Amazing. Keep going there, bud. Or to bud, proclaim or liberty whatever. to the captives. Huh? <laughs> to proclaim liberty to the captives? And that, let, me, let, me, let me say something about that. That means to destroy the works of the devil. It means you don't settle for addiction. It means you don't settle for sexual sin. It means you'd never throw in the towel if you can't get off a porn site. It means you never just let the devil lock the door of that jail and just opt to be a captive. And as preachers of the gospel, it brings deliverance to captives, those who are bound. It's what it does. It is a chain-breaking ministry. Jesus destroys chains. Jesus sets captives free. He brings liberty to the broken and to the helpless. Jesus still sets people free today. Many of you will be set free this morning. Keep reading there, Amy. In recovery of sight to the blind. Well, let me talk about that. When the gospel comes your way in power, the lights go on. You can see. This also applies to physical blindness. That's why you see uh, in the scriptures, Jesus go after the blind. Because yes, it's an actual healing in the physical pointing to a deeper healing. Where we were once blind and unable to see Jesus properly, he opens our eyes through anointed gospel ministry. Isn't that wonderful? Keep going there. To set at liberty those who are oppressed. Mm -hmm. That means the weight of the devil, the weight of our own self-righteousness, the weight of trying to cleanse ourselves. It's what we put on us and what we allow the devil to put on us. Jesus sets us, sets us free. Keep going. To proclaim the acceptable year That of simply the means this. It's time to repent. <laughs> it means this. The Messiah is in their midst and there is a new way of life. The incarnation changed everything. The arrival of Jesus didn't tweak anything. Changed everything. Changed the game. He did not restore us to what Adam had. We have way better. Way better. He did not restore us into Adam's image. He restored us into his image. And Jesus created Adam. I heard someone who I like, but I vehemently disagree with, say, Adam and Jesus were just the same. I go, huh? Can you explain that one? If Jesus formed Adam and breathed the breath of life into his nostrils, what do you mean they're the same? Jesus held his being. He holds all things by the word of his power. So, so the, here, here's the point. The acceptable year of the Lord means this is a season in the history where man must respond to God. It's the acceptable year to receive the Lord. The moment Jesus came on the scene, he broke something new in that we call the kingdom of God. And that's why Mark clearly says, and Matthew, there's only one rightful response. Repent. Turn, turn the entirety of your being to the Lord Jesus, which includes the renewal of the mind. But you have to understand, in the West, the mind camps out on maybe I should think different thoughts. True. But when we talk about the mind of someone biblically, we're talking about the entirety of who they are, their very soul. And so the mind needs to be renewed as well. Can you keep reading, Amy? Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. So he's the book opener and the book closer. And the day will come where the books will be opened once again. We're going to get into that. The day will come where the books will be closed again. So this is very, very prophetic, beautiful, descriptive talk. When it says that Jesus opened the book and Jesus closed the book, he's saying something about himself. So now, Amy, go to Daniel 7, verse 10. I shared these with you guys briefly. And then from here, we're going to get into some of the Beatitudes. Then we're going to walk through the Beatitudes and some of the teachings of the Lord. By then, we'll be at Holy Week. I'm going to teach on the passion of Jesus, on his sufferings. We're going to start with the resurrection of Lazarus, because that really breaks in Holy Week. 
because he's saying that I am the resurrection and life. Long story. His entry into the city on a donkey is his way of saying, I am the king who will return again. It's a precursor to the second coming. So we're going to get into that. By then, by then we're at Easter Sunday and we're going to celebrate the resurrection. Then we get to Pentecost. Never ends. Thank you, Lord. Daniel 7. Woo! Pentecost. Yep. I feel you. Daniel 7, 10. Like <laughs> you guys or something. All right. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Mm -hmm. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times. Ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated and the books were The opened. books were what? Who's the book opener? Jesus. Now, do you remember when... When the Pharisees said to the Lord Jesus, they said, tell us, are you the one? Are you the Messiah? Are you the one to come? What is the Lord's answer? He answers by saying, you will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of glory, seated at the right hand of power. I love this because I love that Jesus answers with scripture. I think that's incredible. But he's telling them, I am the God from Daniel chapter 7. When they heard him say, you will see the Son of Man coming at the right hand of the power, they knew what he was saying about himself. And that's why they wanted to kill him afterward. For people who, who say, Jesus never claimed to be the Lord, I'm like, what are you talking about? It's, I can show you multiple passages where he clearly declared that he is the Lord. Now, I love how Bob Gladstone phrased it uh, when he came to Jesus school one year. He said, when the Pharisees questioned the Lord Jesus saying, are you the one to come? And they sat there as judges. And the Lord answered by saying, you will see the Son of Man coming at the right hand of power. Remember, this thousands upon ten thousands language is, is, is Jude as well, right? He sees the Lord coming with ten thousands upon thousands. So here the Lord is clearly claiming to be God, but Bob Gladstone said, the Pharisees thought they put Jesus on trial. Little did they know that they were on trial with his answer. He's like, you think you're judging me, but let me remind you of who I am. I'm the book opener. So you think you're quizzing me. I'm quizzing you right now. You better get this right. You better get this right. And they didn't get it right. And the whole nation suffered. And Jesus said regarding the persecution that would come to Jerusalem. He wept over the city, saying, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how long, how I've longed to gather you as a hen and her chicks, but you would not come to me. Remember he said that? Not a stone will be left unturned, he said. Why? Because they failed their court case. Be careful when you judge, because you think that person you're judging is on trial. Through your judgment, you're on trial. Be careful. Be careful who you talk about. You know, there's always a, an, an invisible judge present at every conversation. And Jesus is the master at this. Say, he's the book opener. Hallelujah. Revelation 20, verse 12 there, Amy. What, what verse? Sorry, Revelation 20, 12. She's having a baby too. Her baby's all over the place. All right, keep going. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and the books were opened. The books were opened. Keep reading. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. Mm. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The now, say, hold on, say this. Say, God keeps record. And he opens the book. Say, I'll give an account according to the Bible for every work done in the body. That's what Paul said. We'll all give an account for the works committed in the body. So, if you've embraced a version of the faith that is, I came down to an altar and I said the sinner's prayer. Number one, the sinner's prayer doesn't save anybody. 
we use it. We'll use it this morning. But it's not in the Bible. The point is to meet Jesus. Do you understand? We come to him through faith, absolutely, and we repent of our sin, and it is by grace. However, that initial repentance launches us into a lifestyle of repentance. We are meant to be more free from sin a year after our conversion than we were when we converted. That's God's desire. The thought that we can do what we want, how we want, with whatever motive we want, and not give an account is simply unchristian and unbiblical. We will give an account. Now, you will care when the account is occurring. <laughs> we, we tend to think we won't. But I'm telling you, the longer I walk with Jesus, I don't... It, this must be the mercy of God. The longer I walk with Jesus, the more aware I am that one day I'll stand before him. A dying man that we know very well, I don't want to give his name for the sake of honor and respect, pastored a huge church and lost it due to moral failure. Mul multiple accounts of moral failure. It was really sad. But we knew the person very well. They got sick. They were in the hospital. By then, they were, he was up in age. And I went to go pray for him. When I walked in, he so badly wanted to get healed that he tried to begin pulling his... He was on his way into eternity. He was trying to pull the tubes out of himself. It, it, was, it was so sad. And he was doing his best to fight off death that he could feel coming. And so I walked in and it scared me because he was literally ripping these tubes out of himself. I calmed him down. I prayed for him. After that, another person that I'm very close with came in the room and had a talk with this person. I think everybody in the, new, in the room knew that he was going on. And so this leader said to this other leader who was passing, are you afraid to die? And uh, in other words, are you afraid of this process that you've clearly never walked through before? And let's be real, it's the unknown. But I'm grateful for the promises of God. And let's be honest, in that moment, what else are you going to cling to? You're going to cling to the promises of God. And as, I, as I've said multiple times here, I believe that's one of the reasons why the dead in Christ precede those who are in the body at the coming of the Lord because the Lord honors those who pass on in faith and in loyalty. It's a great act of faith, if not the greatest we'll ever face, right? And God honors that. We've, none of us have walked that road. None of us have gone that route before. What is it like to close your eyes and breathe your last? When someone holds on to Jesus through such uncharted territory, God honors it. Aren't you grateful? And so the scripture says, blessed, blessed is the death or the departure of the saints. And so this person said, no, I'm not afraid to die. Very weakly. He said, I'm not afraid to die. But then he said this, but I am afra afraid to stand before him. I never forgot that. I'm afraid to give an account. Because to whom much is given, much is required. It's a real thing. Can you repent of it? Of course. Can you ask for forgiveness? Of course. Can you get restored? Yeah, you can, but I've got to be honest with you. I've been in this for 34 years now. I've been exposed to what we would call, I don't know what we would call our, our circles. Charismatic. Bible preaching environment. I can maybe count on less than one hand of people who had much in the glory, who failed through, through consistent willful sin and who ever got back to where they were. Doesn't mean they weren't anointed. Doesn't mean they didn't keep their gifts. Doesn't mean 
God didn't forgive them, but I've never seen anyone entrusted with more than they had prior to a season of willful sin. So it should send a shockwave through us. God is a restorer. He is merciful. He is loving. He can bring beauty for ashes. Nonetheless, we'll give an account. And the account is connected to motive. And so when the books are opened, number one, you want to be in the Lamb's book of life. I find it so interesting. In fact, Tom and Leslie and I were talking about this uh, a while ago. The, when, when, when the disciples go out two by two and they are charged to preach the gospel, heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead, right? They're charged to do this and they're charged to do it a certain way. And they're also charged to cast out devils, which happened here Sunday night. Thank God. I said, thank God. Now notice we don't glory in the devils. You got to be real careful. They're meant to cast, be cast out. They're not meant to be fellowshiped with and dialogued with. What is our obsession to speak to a stupid, fallen, putrid demon that is behind the world's suffering? We have to be real careful what we glory in. So, the disciples come back all excited. And you know what they said to the Lord? Even the devils obey us. That doesn't sound like Jesus talked. Jesus followers don't have a need to be obeyed. So they're sharing Christian testimony with the heart posture of the enemy. Even the devils obey us. And you know what Jesus said? Do not rejoice that devils obey you. Now, what does he tell them to rejoice in? Rejoice that your names are written in the Lamb's book of life. In other words, rejoice that you are born again. So a true Jesus-filled environment should not be more marked by demonic activity than it is the winning of souls. And to be honest with you, if somebody manifests here, the devil's going to go, if you want it to go. But we're never, ever going to make it about that. I just want to be real clear. Notice what happened after those demons came out last Sunday night. Things got a little interesting in here, didn't they? How many of you were here? Do you think that's by accident? And I, I want to say this very clearly, and hopefully you'll appreciate this. The Christians are meant to be humble, lowly, honoring. We will have no patience here for willful public disruption and flat out rebellion. You will be sent out of the building for the sake of God's people and for the glory of his name. It is not a right to be in God's presence. There is a way to be in God's presence. And like Danny Silk said, at Bethel, if you acted dumb, you left. And that is the reputation I, I want to be clearly known here. We have people to keep safe and protect, and we have a way of doing it. And we make no apologies. And it's because we love you. I just want to say straight up. So you can clap now to make me feel better. All right. Now, Revelation chapter 5, verses 1 through 14. Well, you know, let's skip that. I think we know Jesus is the book opener, amen? All right, let's get to the Beatitudes. Go to Matthew chapter five. Now let's move into these teachings that are so glorious. And Dean Becker touched on the first two so beautifully. And I'm not even gonna attempt to add seasoning to a perfectly seasoned filet that he offered us. That is stupid preaching. <laughs> I'm not doing that. Matthew 5, verse 1, let me read. And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Say this, disciples, come to Jesus, who is seated as the enthroned king. As Dean Becker said, that's why he was seated 
on the mountain. He is telling the world there is a greater lawgiver here than Moses. And I'm the only one qualified to sit down. We don't have record of Moses sitting when he presents Israel with the law. But Jesus here doesn't object to the law. He calls them to a higher law. We've got to get that right. So say this, disciples, come to Jesus. All right, verse 2. Then he opened his mouth and taught them. Say, disciples are willingly taught by the Lord. All right, you ready for this one? You don't have to repeat this. Disciples do not teach the Lord. <laughs> Students learn. And disciples are disciplined. We are a disciplined people. This is so important. Do we glory in discipline? No. We glory in his presence that, thro that flows through the infrastructure of discipline. Even during a time change. <laughs> we resist natural weakness to be in his glory. I'll keep going. Verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And Dean so beautifully said that being poor in spirit simply means without God, I am nothing. Yes. Verse 4. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Now, as you read the Beatitudes, something I want you to pick up is that the beatit each Beatitude is connected to the next. And each beatitude is connected to the one prior. And they flow in a progression of spiritual life. So one beatitude causes the next one to happen in us when we yield to the person of the Lord. So when we talk about being poor in spirit, notice that verse 4 says, blessed are those who mourn. So what does that mean? It means that when we are poor in spirit, we, we, we experience something the reality of our sin. The reality of our need for God. And this is what that should cause. A mourning over our sin. That's a good thing. It's a good thing to not enjoy breaking God's heart. That's a good thing. It doesn't mean you have to live in shame and condemnation. But it also doesn't mean that you accept what hurts the Lord. You don't accept that you are going to be a vessel that grieves the Holy Spirit. My son, Benny, uh, my kids are just flourishing. Uh, I cannot thank you enough for being a local church that's filled with a passion for Jesus because my own kids are being impacted. The, the depth of Theo in the Word of God, he's running camera like crazy, probably going to kill me, but... He got so up in my grill during a worship set two weeks ago with the camera. He's going in circles, and Marina was telling him to do it back in the truck, directing the cameras. I thought I was being surrounded by sharks. I thought, who? I thought which camera guy is crazy enough to get so close to somebody while they're worshiping? And I looked up. It's my son. But then I saw another one go around me. And I thought, how many they got around me? It was just Theo. Just <laughs> and Marina, Marina's like, that's a great shot. Keep him there. Because she knew he's probably the only one that could get away with it. My kids are in the Word daily, serving Jesus. Sophia's led so beautifully, multiple sets or a few songs in the sets. So wonderful. So this past week, my son Benny spoke at Southeastern University uh, with a group of other young, young kids, and he lectured on not grieving the heart of God. It was so beautiful. And that should be natural. So being poor in spirit leads us to mourning. Mourning over what? Our own sin. Where does that lead us to? And this is what I want to touch on before we close today. Verse 5, blessed are the meek. So listen, mourning over sin is very similar to a heart-filled repentance. That leads me into a certain experience with God, meekness. 
Now I want you to notice the reward for the meek. They inherit the earth. So one, we're poor in spirit. That leads me into mourning over my own sin. And mourning over sin leads me to softness, to mercy, to grace. The moment you become aware of your own weaknesses, you will be less likely to point it out in others. There's so many experts on how the church should be. The experts supposedly don't realize they are embodying what the church should never be. It is high and lofty to sit behind a keyboard and criticize when you've never built anything. And that, that, that's what I'm, I started to say. Young millennial Gen Z culture is, that is being infiltrated with a lack of meekness. One of the great proofs that meekness is lacking is this. You. You did this. You did that. You did that. Do you know why? Do you know why you can tell meekness is, 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 is lacking? Because when you're aware of your own sin and you've mourned it, the heart becomes softer. Because you realize, you realize in yourself, I could be just like that. What does Bill say? I'm 10 minutes of bad thinking away from needing a year of help. Something like that. It's just if, if we think improperly for 10 minutes and really meditate on lies, we'll all be jacked up for a little while. Anyone ever got slimed by bad thinking? Have you? How'd that work out? <laughs> How about entering a season of anxiety or depression or oppression? You can't function properly, right? Everything looks different. It's from the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks and the scriptures teach us to guard the heart above all else. For from it flow, from it springs forth the very issues of life. So when the heart gets sick, you'll do some crazy stuff. You'll think some crazy stuff. You'll make bad decisions. When you've had a broken heart, you're less, less quick to judge those who are walking through stupidity. It doesn't mean it's not stupid. It just means it's not your job to focus on it. So meek people in a healthy way are aware of their own process. They're aware that they have not arrived and they're gentle. It's what the Greek word means, meek. To be soft and pliable. Judgmental people are not soft and pliable because they already know everything. So they don't seek to understand. They don't listen. They have formed their opinion and then sometimes they build a ministry based on a false opinion and if they were to allow that opinion to be uprooted, they'd lose everything so they have to stay in offense just to survive. It's a bad, bad situation and God ultimately crushes it. But the meek, the meek inherits something that's much more glorious than, inher than winning an argument. What do they inherit? The earth. How many of you think that's a pretty big deal? Think the earth's a decent uh, gift? <laughs> so you get online. Someone says something you don't agree with. And through your comment, you are going to change the cosmos. <laughs> You're going to change everything. Through your comment. Maybe the fact that you're aware of their post means you weren't reading your Bible or praying or waiting on the Lord. I don't know what people post unless it's Tiger Woods and PGA Tour, some of our team. I'm barely on. It's wonderful. I said it's wonderful. It's hard to hear the Lord when I am studying somebody else's life that is mostly fake on social media. So we sign up to be offended because we're analyzing everything. And humanity was not meant to know what every person they know and don't really know. They were never meant to know what's going on in everyone's life. We're actually meant to know what's going on in our own heart with Jesus and our family and close friends. Yes. 
So the meek, they say, you know, I, I could say that and maybe I would win this comment war. We don't even sit down face to face anymore. It's, it's that or it's this. I could win this moment and feel better. I could glory in dominance. Or I could inherit the earth. Which one do you want? We're talking about the age to come here. Who's God going to entrust in the age to come with authority on the earth? The meek. Who does he really want to entrust with nations prior to the age to come? The meek. Who does the world choose? Loud, opinionated, fallen perspectives who have who struggle with restraint, which is extremely Christ-like. Did Jesus not say I could call down 12 legions of angels to settle this? But he didn't. And it's in the he didn't aspect of restraint that shows true power. When you can do something that you choose not to do, for the glory of a name that's higher than ours, true power, true authority. It's in the restraint that the nature of Jesus is beheld. Don't you remember the disciples saying, let's call down fire? Because Elijah was their example. And what did Jesus say? You don't know what spirit you're of. In other words, you don't know God. You don't know who I am. You don't know the Trinity. We're not like that. We could, but we don't. That's, that's authority. That's meekness. And every time, I, I just want to help you, because in the Christian life, you will be hurt. You will be confused. You will be rejected. You will be broken. This is just who we are and what we do. Remember this. Remember this. You could take things into your own hands. But if you do, you will tie God's. And when vindication takes a while, and maybe you ask that question, when will God just step in and vindicate? When you don't care if he does. When you are finally okay with blessing your enemies God will deal with them and do you see how the need to vindicate ourselves exposes something dark within us you, you understand what I'm saying the meek aren't like that and because of that God entrusts them with the earth with nations with with authority in the age to come. So I'd rather be over like St. Andrews, Scotland one day, the home of golf in the age to come, <laughs> than win an argument online. The meek. Now why does God entrust the meek with such a privilege? Because they're pliable. God's not looking for perfection. He's looking for softness. He's looking for a people that he can move and mold and process and correct and love and build up and break down again. That's the entire nature of pruning the vine. When it's fruit time, we're all excited. Ooh, look at, look at the grapes hanging off my arms. Yeah, you know? <laughs> look at all the fruit. Look at all the fruit. You just, you know, like the guys in New York, they got the Rolexes in their jacket. <laughs> look at all my fruit. Check it out. Look at my life. God's moving. I'm going to post more, post more, post more, post more. And God is moving. You know what God says? Time to break it down again. Time to prune it back with my word. Time to cut it all away. Time to get down to a minimal level and get back to basics so that you can, so that you can bear fruit that remains. The more I do this, the more impressed I am with people's longevity, not their arrival. That's why I... I am just, I'm not changing the gospel. 
for anything or what it looks like to follow Jesus. I don't care what comes with it. But the building your own deal, your own way, in your own timing, with your own strength is not the way of the Lord Jesus Christ. So blowing up, flying like a rocket straight up is not the point. The point is, are you rooted enough in Christ to be doing what you're doing 40 years from now? That's a testimony. It's one of the things I, I, I so honor about Pastor Benny and people like Tommy Reed and wonderful men who've, who've taken their lumps and their bruises and their battle scars, yet they're still in their Bible. They're still spending hours a day with the wor- with, with, uh, in the Word with the Lord, they're still receiving Holy Communion, they still want to be around God's people in the church, they're still declaring Jesus as the only way to the Father, they're still after the kingdom of God, this is beautiful, that's what I want for us, blessed are the meek, alright give me, give me about five more minutes, Psalm 45 verse 4, can you read that Amy Psalm 45 verse 4 And in your majesty ride prosperously because of truth, humility, and righteousness. And your right hand shall teach you awesome things. Read that again. And in your majesty ride prosperously because of truth, humility, and righteousness. Because of truth, humility, and righteousness. And this is connected to God's majesty. Meekness is connected to God's greatness. Isaiah 66, verse 2. I want to give you a bunch of Bible. For all those things my hand has made, and all those things exist, says the Lord. But on this one will I look, on him who is poor and of a contrite spirit. Contrite. Keep reading. And who trembles at my word. Say meekness. Say, the meek tremble at God's word. Oh, we need this. It means we don't listen to scripture like we listen to a blog. That's not what the meek do. The meek position themselves with contrite spirits, broken, humble, meek spirits, and they, they, they prepare their hearts for the speaking of the word and they tremble at it because their deepest desire is to obey. Their worst nightmare is to disobey. This will breed something. You ready? It's kind of a curse word today. Holiness. Holiness. Set apartness and set unto. Say, Lord, I want to tremble at your word. Now, the Bible teaches that a contrite heart or a meek heart is an actual treasure. Amy, turn to 1 Peter 3, verse 4. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart and the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. I don't think we heard that. You want to know how God sees a meek heart? Look look at this, look at this. Rather let it be, and verse 3 talks about outward appearance. Don't get stuck on that. No, I'm not telling you to just be as ugly as you can, but (laughs) do what you can. Just don't get stuck there. All right? Now, I'm happy just as pretty. Now, verse 4. Rather let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. I'm going to say something. We are talking as a generation and have never had less to say. We're the loudest who are saying nothing. It just sounds like a bunch of 
bees cross bred with loud mosquitoes and they have these little hybrid demon babies that fly around your head that just don't stop and it's making a buzzing sound that has nothing to do with the Lord Jesus here the scripture says a, a gentle and quiet spirit meekness it means we listen more than we speak that means gentleness is valued let's, now let's look at God's perspective here which is very precious in the sight of God. How many of you want a treasure within you that is precious in the sight of God? Let's ask him this morning to make us meek. 1 Peter 3.15. Stay there, Amy. Read verse 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Ooh, with meekness and fear. Now, hold on. This is crazy. Listen to this. Peter is telling the disciples or the followers of the Lord, the church, that meekness becomes a testimony of the unbeliever. It means when I am ready to give a defense of the gospel, if it comes through a meek heart, this is a true defense and brings the fear of God over the unbeliever. So the fear of God, the desire to repent, true Holy Spirit conviction actually comes upon people who oppose the gospel when I give a defense with a gentle heart. It's not a vocal tone I'm talking about. It's a softness of heart. Meekness. The last verse, James 1, 21. Are you all liking this today? Yes. Therefore I lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness. Receive with what? Keep reading. The implanted word which is able to save your souls. Whoa. Hold on. How do you receive the word? Meekly. You cannot receive the word without meekness. How powerful is the word? Powerful enough to bring salvation to the soul. Read it again, Amy. Therefore, I lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word. Okay. What's the opposite of meekness in this scripture? Read it, Amy. It's just prior to the mentioning of meekness. Wickedness. Wickedness. And what else? Filthiness. Filthiness. In James, the contradiction or the contradicting heart posture to meekness is filthiness and wickedness. How does God see a lack of meekness? As being filthy. He sees it as being wicked. And now James tells us the only way to receive the implanted word of God properly unto the salvation of your soul is a soft heart. Isn't that wonderful? So how do I receive? With a soft heart. I, and now... You cannot have a soft heart and refuse to be corrected. I'm, I'm not, look, I know what I'm doing right now. We're watch, going to watch idols just bashed, burned up, and destroyed. Yes. We've got to take the acts of God's word to the jugular of what is plaguing this generation. You cannot be incorrectable and call yourself a disciple. Uh, uh, 75% of the role of scripture is corrective. Rebuke, reprove, and correct. And exhort. 75% tells us, don't do that, do this. What's it unto? Conforming us into the image of Jesus. We need it. So a meek heart says, 
Call me higher. Please correct me. I don't know everything. I need the word of God preached to me, listen, through a human being. Oh, I love Jesus, but I just, I don't, I don't like, I don't want his word coming to me through people. I don't trust their leadership. Well, there's this thing called the church that is made of human beings. You'd be more comfortable with human beings if you talked to them rather than looked at a screen. There's this thing called a person. They breathe. They feel stuff. They might talk back to you if you talk to them. Meek hearts love the word of God, whether it comes as a scalpel or a balm. And both are surgical. Both make us better. Whether it's the scalpel or the balm of Gilead, both heal us. Both are part of the process. Say, I want to be meek. I want to inherit the earth. All right. So to review, Joel, can you help me? One, being poor in spirit, realizing my need for God, makes me aware of my sin. Now, the promise is this. I love this. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It means the front door to kingdom life, to freedom, is being poor in spirit, realizing your need for God. That leads me into mourning over how I've broken the heart of God. That mourning brings the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Many of us do not receive the comfort of the Spirit because we hold on to our weakness and our sin. And John talks about it. He talks about bringing it into the light, not hiding our sin in the darkness. All right? That mourning leads me, I love this, leads me to meekness. That meekness qualifies me to receive the word of God unto the salvation of my soul and be entrusted by God in the age to come. How many of you want that? All right, stand to your feet then. Let's ask the Lord. Without anyone moving, unless you're on the communion team, without anyone moving, this morning, I want to open the altars before we receive Holy Communion to those of you, listen, those of you who have been experiencing a hardness of heart and have never truly seen your sin as what it is. Now listen carefully. Our sin, Michael's sin, your sin, sent Jesus to the cross. How expensive is it? How expensive is the tree? Wasn't our friend's sin only that sent, sent Jesus to the cross? Wasn't our enemy's sin that sent Jesus to the cross only? No, it's our sin, my brokenness, my rebellion, my refusal to bow my knee to the Lord Jesus and be a true disciple after I leave the altar. And Jesus is looking for true followers, true followers. And this is what discipleship looks like. When we choose such a life, that hardness of heart becomes a bondage. Becomes a bondage. And we protect ourselves. We protect ourselves from the Lord and from people. You say, what's at stake? Eternity is at stake. For the meek inherit the earth. What's at stake? The comfort of the spirits at stake. Those who mourn are comforted by the Spirit. Do you know the Bible says here that there's a blessing for those who mourn? That word bless, makarios, means filled with the joy and well-being and presence of God Himself. There's nothing worth holding on to if it means losing that. So with every head bowed and eye closed, look, this morning... Maybe somebody brought you. Maybe your heart's drifted from the Lord. Maybe you've never really fully yielded to become a disciple, a true disciple of the Lord Jesus, to lose your will, to lay it down. Maybe you're stuck in sin and it's been destroying you and you know it. 
Maybe you've been living in a horrible shame as you walk through the doors of churches like this. You're bound and you can't get free. I'm here to tell you, Jesus Christ is still setting the captive free. This is still the acceptable year of the Lord. With every head bowed and eye closed, you want to, you say, Michael, look, I need peace with God. I want to know that blessing that belongs to the meek, to the poor in spirit, and to those who mourn. I want the comfort of the spirit. I want you to raise your hand and put it back down very quickly. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. If you raise your hand or you wish you did, in just a moment, I'm going to open these altars and invite you down. Again, I want you to look at someone, if you brought someone this morning, and say to them, look, go get right with Jesus. If you're sitting next to someone and you know their life is in and out, you know they're not walking with God, it might be your child, it might be a friend you brought, it might be somebody you know, you know the inner workings of their life. The best thing you could ever do for them is lead them into the loving arms of the Lord Jesus Christ. And for those of you in the room who once walked with the Lord and that fire's gone out, come to the one whose eyes are filled with fire overflowing. He'll set you on fire today. You say, I need Jesus. I want you to come down now. Everybody who raised their hand or you wish you did, come down. God bless you. Let's give the Lord praise. Come down. We'll wait for you on the balcony. Just get down here. We've got all the time in the world. Thank you, Lord. Come on, give the Lord praise. Thank you, Jesus. Do not, do not, do not, do not risk your soul. What can man give in exchange for his soul? Oh, hallelujah. Come on, this is beautiful. So beautiful. Come. You may have grown up in church your whole life. This morning you heard the gospel. You heard what it means to belong to the Lord Jesus. Come. Come. Let nothing keep you. Let nothing keep you from the arms of the Lord. Yes. God bless you. Come, young man. I believe, you know, I, I, you'll have to just trust me as your pastor. I have no need to feel better about this. This isn't about me. This is about the Lord and these people. But I feel that there's more. I feel there's more people who have not really been introduced to a true Christian life, what it means to be a disciple. I want to open these altars. Come and lay your life down. God bless you. God bless you. Hallelujah. And while they're coming, I just want you guys just praying. Is there anyone else? Yeah. Is there anyone else? Yeah. God bless you, ma'am. Come down. Come on, guys. Let's celebrate the, what the Lord is doing. Thank you, precious Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God bless you. Come, come, sir. Come on. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, this is wonderful. Can we just lift our hands begin thanking the Lord? Come. They're still coming. This is wonderful. This is, let's make room for them, guys. Make room for them. Hallelujah. We got room here up front. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Emma, can you come? Give you all the praise. All the praise. Guys, can we just lift our hands begin just thanking the Lord in the spirit? They're still coming. This is wonderful. Come, 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 come. Hallelujah. Just lift your voices just a little. That river, I'm telling you, that river of Holy Spirit conviction is still flowing. It's still flowing. And I'm not going to resist it. I, I, if there's more of you, if there's any more of you, come down. Come down. Thank you, Lord. Give you all the praise. I feel that blessed wind blowing that Jesus talked about in, in John chapter 3. Hallelujah. Blessed, blessed be your holy name. Blessed be your holy name.
God bless you, young man. Let him up front here, please. If we don't have time for this, what do we have time for? Yeah, keep playing that, Emma. I feel the Lord. Is there anyone else who needs to humble themselves before this mighty God? Is there anyone else who's been bound with sin? Listen to the word of the Lord. Either we throw ourselves upon the rock or the rock crushes us. This is the hour to throw ourselves upon the rock of the Lord Jesus. God bless you. Come. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, precious Lord. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Keep praying, guys. God's moving. God bless you. Come. Throw yourselves upon the rock. You know, the only thing that keeps us from the cross, the only thing is the pride of life. It's us holding on to us. It doesn't matter what you'll look like to, to people in this room. You come and cast yourselves at the feet of Jesus, you'll look beautiful to him. It's a glorious thing. Look, they're still coming. Come, come, young lady. Come, come. Come, come, come. Come to Jesus. Yes, young man. Come, come down this aisle. Yes, God bless you. This is holy. God bless you. Keep praying. They're still coming down from the balcony. Look, thank you, precious Lord. Thank you, precious Lord. Do not choose you over your eternity. Do not do it. Look, they're coming in droves. Come, come, come. Get right with God. Come to Jesus. Yes, God bless you. Come, come. Come throw your sin at the altar. Come throw your sin at the feet of the Savior. Come get that stain washed away. Yeah, keep playing, Emma. Come, come, come. Blessed be the name of the Lord. God bless you, young man. Come. See, all the Holy Spirit needs is a little room, a little time, just a little time. Holy, holy, holy. Keep blessing him, church, as you pray. That anointing keeps flowing. Just keep praying. As you look, they're coming. They're coming all from upstairs. As you pray, that anointing keeps flowing. It's not by might. It's not by power. It's by the Spirit. It's the precious Holy Spirit who grabs us and pulls us close and leads us to Jesus. Holy, 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 holy. You will not care about how you look when you stand before the Lord. You'll care about one thing. Do you belong to the Lord Jesus? Have your sins been washed? Are you covered in the blood? Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Holy is the Lord. God bless you. God bless you. Come to Jesus who's so merciful. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You're still coming. It's real. You can tell. Thank you, Father. I went to tr two missions. God bless you. I went to two missions training facilities, schools, years ago. These were missionaries. Keep playing. Keep playing. Y'all keep praying. These were missionaries supposed to go into the nations. The Lord said, preach the gospel there. I said, to missionaries, don't they know the gospel? He said, preach the gospel. Both environments, 300 to 400 a night got born again. They had never really heard the gospel. Look, look, here they're still coming. I give you all the glory. That's right. I love seeing people walk people down. Come on, do the work of an evangelist in your own family right now. Don't be afraid of your kids. Look them straight in the eye. Say, son, daughter, you need Jesus. You need Jesus. Kids, look at your parents. If they're in here playing a game, you know the real them. Look them in the eye. Say, mom and dad, you know you need Jesus. Tell them. You grab them. You walk them down here. Do it. It'd be a beautiful thing. What a memory that would be. As if God used your children to bring you to the foot of the cross. Hallelujah. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord.
praise you, Lord. I'm going to begin praying. And when I do, you will not interrupt me. You will not interrupt God. The Lord is available. And I'm going to begin praying. We're all going to pray together. And, and guys, as you're there praying for them, there's going to come a point where I begin to ask the Lord to fill them with his spirit. And that's what I want. Les, you and Tom can do whatever you want. If you don't want to, that's fine. But I want us to believe that when we begin praying that, listen, church, yes, there'll be a divine transaction here, but they're going to go from sinner to saint, from prodigal to found, from backslider to passionate about Jesus. But there'll come a moment where we ask the Lord to empower them with the Spirit. And I want us to believe in faith. I said, I want to believe in faith that God will truly touch them with his holy power. All right, let's pray this out loud. Father in heaven, here I am, as real as I know to be. Forgive my sin. Wash me. Cleanse me with the precious blood of Jesus. You promised to forgive my sin if I confessed it. And here I am, confessing it. You are faithful and just to forgive my sin and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Wash me and cleanse me. And I forgive those who sinned against me. I release them. I release offense. And I repent of my sin. I turn from this world. I turn from the devil and I put all my trust. Come on, say it out loud. I put all my trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. I give my entire life to the Lord Jesus Christ who suffered and died and shed his precious blood to wash my sin away and to purchase me. Jesus, you are alive today raised from the dead and ascended to the right hand of the Father. You are seated as King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And today I declare that you are my King, the King of my house, King of my family, the King of my heart. In Jesus' precious name, I belong to you. Take this life do as you will offer me my cross that I might carry it along with yours in Jesus precious and holy name now everyone stretch your hands towards these precious people and just begin praying the Lord's touching many already Ooh, praise you Lord this is very special stretch your hands towards them Father, now I want you to all to just agree with me. Just agree with me. Father, you are the great baptizer. You're the one who sends the Holy Spirit. Your son Jesus is the baptizer in the Holy Spirit in fire. And Jesus, your precious son, told us that we could ask you for the Spirit. You're the one who doesn't give a stone for bread or a serpent for fish. How much more do you give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? That's all. And so now, Lord, these blood-washed, repentant children of yours are asking you for the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. Let your fire fall upon them. Oh, come on, guys, you who are praying, release that on them. Let your power fall upon them. Empower them for a life with you. Empower them to be a true witness. Empower them to burn in this generation. Fill them, I pray, with the joy of their salvation. Joy unspeakable, filled with glory. Fill them with the peace of God that only comes by the Spirit. Come upon them, Holy Father, in great power today. In Jesus' precious name.
Can the communion ushers come and just wait right here? Praise you, Father. I know many of you are being touched by the Lord. If you're able, only if you're able, or you feel like it's right, just look at me for a moment. The Lord heard you. There's no need for me to go through what's in the book. I, I don't want to do that, but I want you all to keep those booklets. I want you to take them home and use them to help, help you be spiritually formed in Jesus. Don't throw those booklets away. I'm going to ask you to be sure to connect with somebody at our new believers table. We're gonna, after we take communion, you'll walk right out there. This is vital because you need to be planted in the house of God. You need to get baptized in water. You need to be discipled in the Lord Jesus. You need to learn to pray, learn to study the scriptures, learn to receive the sacraments of the church so that you will be firmly rooted in the Lord. How beautiful is it, church? Is, can we thank the Lord? This is so glorious. Thank you, Jesus. Church, how beautiful will it be to watch them receive communion right now after such a sacred time? So could we just part uh, this, these, just some area here where these two aisles are? And if our, if our communion ushers could come, and maybe you guys could stand, those of you who are on your knees, you can stand up. Can we thank the Lord one more time? And you guys can just wait, and we'll serve you first. It'd be an honor to serve you first. Now, for those of you who've never received communion here, we don't want anyone to receive it alone. So you're going to come forward as you're dismissed once these folks at the altar are, are, are given the elements. You're going to come forward. You're going to take those elements back to your seat and receive it with somebody. Do not receive it by yourself. If you see someone who's alone, invite them. If you're alone, ask. Say, can I, can I receive communion for, with you? For those of you who are sick in body, receive the meal in faith. Did you hear it? Come on, I need an amen. I'm expecting, I'm expecting that by the end of the day today, before we get to Sunday night service, that I will hear of healing testimonies from this covenant meal. And I, if you're praying with someone who's sick, just tell them, say, move your body. I mean, let's come in faith discerning the body of the Lord Jesus, huh? Stretch your hands to, to heaven. I'm in a prayer over the elements. Holy Father, thank you for this precious bread and fruit of the vine, the very blood of Jesus, this bread that is your body, that heals us, that cleanses us, that strengthens us. And we ask you, wonderful Lord, that by the Holy Spirit, you would descend upon this house and upon these elements and that we do not receive mere bread and juice, but the very body and blood of the Lord Jesus. Heal your people, protect your people, cleanse your people, fill your people with divine life. And we thank you, Lord, for the beauty of the table where you sit and serve us and, are, and you are our meal at the same time. What a wonder you are in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Can we give the Lord all the praise? The ushers, the ushers will dismiss your row. And those of you who have come forward, you're welcome to receive it here. Um, actually, it's probably best you go back to your seats just to make room so we can begin dismissing the rows. But can we thank the Lord one more time? Precious Lord, thank you. The rest of you can be seated until your rows dismiss.
We believe that the nations will descend on this land. That the sick will be healed here. That the lost will be saved here. That the presence of the glory of God will rest here. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. That the mountains might shake at your presence. That the gospel will go forth from here. Shaking the earth for the glory of God. That the presence of Jesus Christ would dwell among us. Here we will enter into the peace of your presence. Here we will remain. Jesus said, remain in me and I in you. Here we will remain. This is holy ground. Where only one thing is needed, Jesus. May Jesus be pleased with all that takes place here. May he be adored and worshiped here. May his word be taught in clarity and love here as we tell the generations to come the praises of the Lord and His strength and His wonderful works He has done. May the generations come to find Him here. To find Jesus here. Here. Together we will build the house of God. And a home for His people. 